questions. Um, the first one was, there seems to be two general ways of dealing with difficulties, applying antidotes in Lojong and thinking about emptiness, which is a very, very concise summary, nice one. Then he goes on to say, could there be a risk of denial or avoidance if one tries to think that everything is just empty and use that as an excuse for not looking to see what is actually going on in one's own mind? So 100%, right? This is the danger. This is the danger for all of us. This is the danger for anyone engaged in anything that they're at all labeling self-improvement, right? Or philosophical development. This is a danger for all of us, is that we get absorbed in a new idea that makes sense. And then we assume because we understand it, that we do it. Right? We, we, we think that our intellectual understanding of it, our conviction in it, our belief in it, is the same thing as having integrated it. And then we start to act as if we already are embodying it, when in fact it's still living in the realm of intelligence and just kind of percolating down and gradually digesting. So think of your Dharma practice a little bit like there's a big funnel on top of your head. And at the top of the funnel is all of the things that you've heard and that you understand. But then the tiny part of the funnel is like dripping down drip by drip into what you actually embody, into what you've actually integrated. So you've known most of your adult life, all of your adult life, that having patience is useful. <laughs> Right? But does that mean that you're always patient? You already believe it. You already think it's a good idea. You're convinced. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you live it all the time, right? But probably you live it more than you did as a teenager or a young adult, you know, theoretically, right? Theoretically, some of us have lost our patience as, late, as years have gone by. But anyway, you know what I mean? So what we want to avoid here is spiritual bypassing. Is this a, a word that you guys have come across? Yeah, no, half, <laughs> half. So spiritual bypassing is basically because you understand how you should think about something, you assume that's how you already do think about something, all right? Or because you know how you should respond, you pretend as if that is how you actually are responding. So you're jumping over the actual experience in the present. Yeah, so take the case of patience because it's accessible. You know, someone is being really obnoxious at work. They're being really rude. They're being inconsiderate of others. And you think, I am a Dharma practitioner and should be patient so that I come up with creative and wise, skillful solutions. Mm. You know, like a robot. You think, bum, bum, I will do that. You know, but really, you're just really mad. Yeah, you're mad. You think, how dare they? That is so rude. That's your actual reaction. But you know, you know your reaction, quote, should be this Dharma reaction. So you like put a plastic covering of it over it and act as if you are patient when actually you're enraged. Right? This this can happen to us. This is called spiritual bypassing. And you know, it's the same as as people who get a little bit fake plastic happy. You know, and you say, oh, how are things going for you? You know, and they just like are behind on their mortgage and in terrible debt and have filed for bankruptcy and all sorts of things are happening. And they say, oh, yeah, it's all good. Oh, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, yeah, fine. <laughs> and you're like, is it? <laughs> is it <laughs> really? You know, and there's a way of framing it so that it is all good and it is the path and it is fuel for practice, but it isn't yet. And to pretend otherwise skips a step, which skips integration, which means you don't go as deeply. And that's the best case scenario, that you just don't go as deeply. The worst case scenario is you become a glassy-eyed fanatic telling lies to yourself about who you should be and how you should be. And you get into fundamentalist thinking and kind of the opposite of self-awareness. Yeah, you completely are like gaslighting yourself. 
So this is what can happen. And it's, it's a real danger for all of us, not just Dharma practitioners, not just this topic. You know, you can get into therapy and start doing this. You could in, get into Greek philosophy and start doing this. You can get into science and start doing this. Because you understand a premise, you think that you've already applied it. And there's a gap. So you acknowledge the gap through a real friendliness and sense of humor about we are full of hypocrisy and full of inconsistencies, but we're growing, you know, like we're getting there slowly, slowly, you know, be nice to yourself about it and laugh at how inconsistent you are because that shows that you're not too identified with it. You can tell that you've overly identified with your quote deficiencies if you get defensive when self-awareness brightens up or when someone calls you on your inconsistency. You know, for example, if someone says to me, Yunten, you talk really fast. I will laugh at myself because I do talk really fast. It's too fast. It's slower than it used to be, believe it or not, but it's too fast and I'm working on it. And so at first I'll be like, oh no, I did it again. But also like, oh, yep, okay, yep, I, you're right. But if it's something that I haven't made peace with, if it's something I haven't acknowledged, then I'll feel ashamed or defensive. Yeah, my pride will get triggered in some way, and I'll think that there's somebody to defend, which is a symptom of grasping at an inherently existent self. So we're working on not grasping at the inherently existent self. Part of that project is waking up our self-awareness enough to know we aren't our deficiencies. We also aren't our qualities. They just live here and we're working on them, you know? So hopefully that helps that question a bit. Um, <clears throat> yeah, did that help your, your question? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, it was a good question. Um, so then there was another question, also excellent. Um, so since self is variable and dependent, there must be some force that drives self to change. That force being karma and altruism being our lens, which sees that which is beyond good and bad. What karma is essential for the self? Essential in the context that helps self just be, whether present or absent, rather than its identification in the first place. So this is tying into the discussion on the subtlest level of dependent arising or the subtlest understanding of dependent arising, which is that everything depends upon a valid basis and mere designation. So this one is subtle and I'm gonna unpack it in a second. So just like put a pin in that, that is really important um, and we're gonna unpack it. There was a related question, which is, Sometimes people have different reactions to the same event. It's due to their karma or their habituation to react in that way. Are our habits um, kind of our own karma? So those two questions are kind of going into the realm of relationship of karma and emptiness. So I think that um, I'll kind of show you the thing I meant to show you and see what you think about it. And then if your questions aren't asked, answered, then please ask again. Okay, so that's my plan. And let me just check, I see in the chat, there's a couple things. We should be like Poe from Kung Fu Dragon, someone has told me, that's quite true. And <laughs> let's see, because definitions fixed in our mind, the conflict and block in our understanding. Yep, yeah, okay. Yep, yeah, nice ones, good points, folks. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears. I'm gonna try something different and see what you think. What I'm going to try is I'm going to play you a video clip of a ridiculous video that is got surprising profundity. Has anyone ever seen I Heart Huckabees? No, put it on your to-do list. It's absurd, but it's very useful in terms of understanding the Buddhist view of dependent arising and emptiness. So I'm gonna play you a clip and 
because the main character is played by Dustin Hoffman and he speaks even more quickly than me, I've added subtitles and some space. So you can kind of like think for a second about what he just said. So, um, so he'll say full speed and then there'll be a pause for you to read it, okay? And then I'm gonna switch gears into a reading by Lama Zopa Rinpoche explaining this relationship between emptiness and karma. And then there'll be another movie clip kind of touching that karma angle. And that's from Eternal Sunshine on the Spotless Mind, which is another absurd movie which has Dharma flavor to it. So that's gonna be about 10 minutes. So kind of, you know, get your popcorn. We're gonna have a movie mode, okay? And just see how you go. Okay, let's get started. It's part of my investigation. Yes, say this blanket represents all the matter and energy in, in the universe, okay? You, me, everything. Nothing, Nothing has been left out, all right? All the particles, everything. What's outside this blanket? More blankets, that's a point. Blankets everything. Exactly. Exactly. This is everything, okay? Let's just say that this is me, right? And I'm what sixty odd years old and I'm wearing a gray suit, blah blah blah. And let's And let's say over here, this is you, and you're, I don't know, you're 21, you've got dark hair, etc. And over here, this is uh, Vivian, my wife and colleague. And then over here. And then over here, this is the Eiffel Tower, right? It's Paris. And this is a war. And this is a, a, a museum, and this is a disease, and this is an orgasm, and this is a hammer. Everything is the same, even if it's different. Exactly. Our everyday mind forgets this. We think everything is separate, limited. I'm over here, you're over there, which is true, but it's not the whole truth. But it's not the whole truth because we're all connected. Because we are connected. Sure, 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 sure. Okay? Yeah. We need to learn how to see the blanket truth all the time, right in the everyday stuff. And that's what this is for. Why? Why what? Why do I need to learn how to see the blanket thing all the time in the everyday stuff? Well, You wouldn't want to miss out on the big picture, would you? Uh -uh. That's partly why you're here, right? And it's and this is it. I'm talking about it right now. I mean, it'll take a while for you to get it, you know? But... get the blanket thing you can relax because everything you could ever want or be you already have and are
sound pretty good. Sounds very good. All right, get in. You want me to get in? Mm -hmm. So get in here? Yeah. What's going to happen to me in there? Oh, hey, you're going to see. You'll find out. So back to mere labeling. In the case of a bell, the bass has to have a certain shape and perform the function of ringing. That's what validates it. What is it then that causes us to label things positive or negative? What's the force behind all this? It's karma. So now we're switching to how things exist the last chapter. Because of past karma, some people are able to label things positively while others have to label them negatively. The underlying cause is karma. Therefore, you can see how crucial it is to purify past negative karma and not to create any more. In other words, how essential it is to practice dharma. So the ignorance holding the concept of true existence is like a farmer. Karma the action motivated by this ignorance is like a field in which various types of crops can grow. Consciousness on which karma leaves all the imprints is like the seed. And of course, seeds also have imprints. One tiny seed carries all the potential to grow a huge tree with many billions of branches that cover a huge area. Similarly, karma multiplies from one action, many effects of a similar type. Like a seed, the consciousness on which karma left all the imprints contains all the potential. The consciousness continued from your past life to this life and will continue from this life to your next life, carrying all these imprints. The imprint left by karma on the consciousness is then made ready to bring its own rebirth, its own future samsara, the aggregates, by craving and grasping, which are like the minerals. That is called becoming or potential existence, which is like a seed becoming ready to produce its sprout. The next life or rebirth starts with name and form, which is like the sprout grown from the seed. After that comes the sense bases or six sources, contact, feeling, and then in terms of experience, old age and death. So those are referring to the 12 links, not in the order of teaching, but in the order of experience. The conclusion is that from morning to night, from birth until death, whatever happiness and suffering we experience, and whatever good and bad objects appear to us, they all come from our consciousness, which carries all the imprints. Everything that appears to us from birth until death comes from our own consciousness. All the different experiences we have of people, places, and sense objects come from our consciousness, which carries the imprints. It is not only that everything appears to us today and from birth until death comes from our consciousness, but also that the whole appearance of samsara comes from consciousness, which is our own mind. Not only that, but it comes from karma, which is also our own mind. As we discussed earlier, the definition of karma is the intention arisen from the principal consciousness. So karma is our own mind. Everything comes from our own mind, from karma. Not only that, but everything that appears to us comes from our own mind, from ignorance.
So karma may seem romantic, the way we repeat patterns year after year, relationship after relationship, job after job, life after life. But it is actually extremely poignant, tragic even, how we keep reinventing the wheel. Consider the way things appear falsely to your mind as more than merely labeled and try to break the habit of believing all the lulls in life, all the triumphs and all the tragedies are as they seem. They're not. Did it make sense? Yeah. So yes, karma influences our appearances. Karma came from ignorance. Ignorance is conditioning all of our responses. Those responses leave seeds. Those seeds have imprints. So basically we have this appearance of inherent existence, but then we reinforce it all the time. It's like, it wouldn't be such a big deal if we just had like a moment of it but we have this appearance and then we believe it and then we act from that place and then we suffer. So if we wanna reverse that whole thing, we have to see that it was an illusion to begin with. Follow-up thoughts? Someone has written in the chat, same partner, different haircut, indeed, <laughs> right? <clears throat> I've got a follow-up comment yeah. from, the, from the meditation we did before the break. You know, you have this sense, okay, this thing that I've been grasping at, it, it's not there. It doesn't exist. And so then my reaction is, well, oh my gosh, there's so much nonsense I've been doing to service something that doesn't even exist. I need to just throw all of this out. But then it starts to feel like it's a bit too dangerous to just throw everything out. Yeah, yeah, it's that line, isn't it? Because it, you know, you can think everything's empty of inherent existence, and then someone hits you over the head with a pot, and you go, ow, oh, it doesn't exist, doesn't exist, you know, like, <laughs> that's not what we're saying, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a razor's edge, it's a razor's edge between nihilism and eternalism, it's a razor's edge between acknowledgement of relative truth and belief that it is as it seems. So when we say relative truth, conventional truth, we're not saying not truth, we're saying deceptive truth. So there is something there, but it is so subtle, it's as if it doesn't, which is why we're not nihilists. But you know, it's like we're tiptoeing to the very cliff and looking over the edge into nihilism and then taking just a tiny step back. His Holiness sometimes says the, the middle way autonomous view, which is slightly less subtle than our view, is maybe a more useful walking around strategy. The walking around strategy basically is that assume 90% of what appears to you is your own projection and 10% is from the side of the basis. Middle way consequence school would say like 0. 0.00000001 is from the side of the basis and all of the rest is your projection. But that can make us go crazy, especially in the beginning. To think 90% of what appears to your mind is your own projection, which is conditioned by ignorance and karma, that's confronting enough, right? We usually think it's the other way around on a good day, right? On a good day, we think 90% is them, but sure, 10% is me, sure. I'll, I'll, gi I'll give myself 10%, it's my projection, right? So even if we could reverse and think 90% is my projection, really? Oh my goodness, I make myself miserable, you know? <laughs> How embarrassing. Yeah, it's interesting. So don't think there's nothing there. You know, you know that there is, it's just not as it appears. Yeah, there's a, this reaction, which is, uh, there's so much I need to throw out because there's so much I'm doing that's wrong. Yeah. But where do you, 
you know, yeah. Well, yeah, I think if you can live in an ethical way, you know, avoiding the 10 non-virtues and then kind of, I think get rid of the idea that anybody is watching, you know, like you live according to the 10 virtues, avoiding the 10 non-virtues, or, you know, simply put ethically, you live ethically, but without the idea that there's some God or some parent or some higher version of yourself clapping, you know, you just do it because it's worthwhile in and of itself, even imperfectly. And that creates a habit of, I do my best and I let go. And I do my best and I let go because my best is going to be imperfect while I have a mind with ignorance, but it's way better than just autopilot which is what I've been doing from beginningless time. Just knee jerk, instinctual, you know, animal brain, lizard brain, you know. True, true. But, but there, there may be not, if so, let's say there's no watcher applauding or, or, or booing. Still, there's a future self that's going to have to experience the screw ups I'm making right now. Yeah. And that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's what purification's for, Dave. <laughs> that's what purification's for. <laughs> clean slate that sucker each day. Okay. Yeah, uh, clean slate yep. that slucker. Shake it off. Yep. Okay. You know? <laughs> you know? And I guess that's the thing about just good old four opponent powers, right? Is that you got your refuge and your regret. That's easy enough. Some sort of remedy, right? Vajrasattva, meditation on emptiness, meditation on love, something right? But then the resolve, that's the piece that takes a lot of self-awareness because you have to really be honest about for how long can I change without rebellion or without distraction or without, you know, overestimating my abilities and then having a backlash and a burnout. The, the power of resolve is the hardest one, I think, because you can notice where you slipped off your path easy enough, I'm guessing, you know, you're like, oh, you shouldn't have said that, you know, at the end of the day. But how long can you not do it again is really how long can you stay awake, you know, awake to yourself. And so to say, okay, just the rest of the hour, I'm not going to say that. And then you stretch it to the rest of the night or tomorrow when I see so-and-so and we usually gossip about politics and we usually rant and rave about foreign policy and we get all stirred up and angry, not even at each other, just at the world and none of it is solving anything. We're just kind of entertaining ourselves with our own anger. Tomorrow I won't instead of forever I won't, you know, just tomorrow. It's very AA, right? It's like very one day at a time, but that's a very practical psychology for yourself because if you you know stretch it too far you get overwhelmed and collapse but you you know if you bookend your day solid motivation in the morning solid purification at night you know the years rush by and there's this continuity of meaning yeah there's this continuity of you realize your life has built this depth and this meaning over the years and you actually aren't doing too bad yeah and, you know, you've been a Dharma student long enough that if you did a good, like, assessment, a self-assessment, you'd be like, yes, okay, I am better than 10 years ago, you know? Maybe. When you're bad, you might be just as bad as you ever were. It just doesn't happen as often, right? Like, when you do lose your mindfulness and you say or do the wrong thing, it could be just as awful as it was 20 years ago. It's just less frequent and possibly doesn't last as long. Maybe the intensity is toned down. Maybe it's not, you know, habits are hard to change. But don't think that if you slip up and you do something so out of your Dharma path and so like who you were before you met this, that it's like a failing of your practice. You know, it's more like, look at all the days you didn't. Yeah, you gotta, gotta be nice to yourself, man. <laughs> Right? This is hard. This is so hard. I'd be nice Our, to my future self. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And what you don't want is a legacy of guilt and shame. Mm, mm. You know, you want your spiritual path to feel 
empowering and joyful. And that every time you catch a mistake, you go, oh, I caught that one. Think of how many lives I never caught it. Think of how many lives I gave into it and fed it. Think of all the lives I had wrong views the whole time. Mm. You know, there were whole lifetimes where we thought animal sacrifice is a great idea. There were whole lifetimes where we thought that. (laughs) There were whole lifetimes where we thought lack of ethics, who cares? You know, it's amazing that we found any kind of structure to work for the greater good. It's remarkable. So, of course, we're going to forget sometimes. It's new. <laughs> you know, it's new. Okay. Um, Thanks. Yeah. You're not alone in beating up on yourself, I think. Um, in the chat, there was a question. Can you share a few techniques of purification? I mean, the main one that we're talking about today is emptiness yeah so in other classes in other courses look at vajrasattva practice using the four opponent powers that is really essential practice the four opponent powers being connect with refuge connect with regret not guilt remedy resolve right make them all start with r so you remember them yeah Refuge, regret, remedy, resolve, four opponent powers. That is the ingredients that will burn your negative karmic seeds so that they won't give you suffering. You think of anything you remember, and then you assume that there are many things of a similar type that you don't remember and purify those. And it's a good daily practice. If it's too soon for you to do a daily practice of it, It can be a cup of tea at the end of the day in your favorite armchair practice. You know, you come home from work, you put your feet up, you have a glass of water, a glass of tea or something, and you just think, how was today? Yeah. Where did I slip off my path, you know, at breakfast, (laughs) in transit, at work, you know, and you just go through the chapters of your day and really recognize a fault to be a fault without slipping into a story of identification or excuses. You just say, yeah, I went on a whole rant the other day about politics that did not help anyone. It just helped me articulate my worldview, which I already knew. So not tomorrow. Okay. (laughs) You know, and you're just having a conversation, cup of tea, really relaxed, but it helps you change your patterns And then you want to switch at the end of that and think of the things you did well. You know, so-and-so was being obnoxious and you were nice to them. Well done, tick. You know, you're the observer of your own life and you're noticing there are times that really your practice kicked in. So rejoicing is nice to uplift the mind, but it also increases the merit of the day. Yeah, if you repeat your awareness of where you stayed on your path, you maximize the merit of it. Yeah, it's right in the sutras, right? Lama Zopa Rinpoche always encourages this rejoicing practice. And the word rejoicing is kind of like cheesy, right? It's like, oh, rejoice, yay, I'm great. You know, it sounds awkward and like, ugh. but actually just kind of make it really real and personal and think, okay, I wanted to hit snooze. And I didn't hit snooze for the first time all week. I didn't hit snooze when my alarm clock went off and I got up and I fed the cat right away. I didn't wait for him to meow and be grumpy at me. You know, those tiny little triumphs that no one but you knows about, they're significant, you know? They're significant and they're worth kind of honoring. So give yourself a break, I think. Um, When you do purification, remember to also rejoice. So that's secular, you know, we're talking about, um, or not secular, that's relative. Now we're talking ultimate. Ultimate purification is to think about the three spheres of emptiness, which means the agent, the action, and the object are all empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. How do they dependently arise? Those three levels we talked about earlier. So the agent is you, you're the one that did the thing, right? So you're empty of inherent existence, how? Okay, you are dependent on causes and conditions, right? You're dependent on parts, you're dependent on mind's imputation. Yeah, the self is that, right? So 
then your action, you did the wrong thing. Say you said a rude thing. That's empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. There were countless causes and conditions that made you say that. There is lots of parts and context about that being harsh from your perspective, harsher to someone else's, less harsh from someone else's. Yeah, so it being harsh is relative, right? And it even being harsh itself is merely labeled by the mind on the basis of those words, which many people have various opinions about. And so you think, okay, it being negative and the way it came about, both. I have responsibility for, but they're not mine, right? Responsibility, but not fault. Responsibility, but not fault. Responsibility, but not fault. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying, right? You're like, I did it, but not all by myself, <laughs> right? If the weather had been warmer, if my mother had been kinder, <laughs> right? If my socks didn't have holes in them, whatever, like a million reasons. There's a million reasons. They landed here, so you take responsibility, but not all of this identification of therefore I'm bad. You know, that's too far and it's not true. And then the object, right? So we have the agent, the action, then we look at the object. Who did you do the thing towards? Yeah, who did you say the wrong thing to? Okay, person B. Person B has their own karmic predisposition, which means they copped those words because they created the cause for it. Now, you still shouldn't have said it, but you would have said it to someone else if they hadn't created the cause. So you still need to not say it, but the reason they got it is their karma. So they created the cause for that one causes and conditions, right? They also happen to be in your face doing whatever they were doing at the time, which was some sort of condition for you to respond in that way. There's also many parts of that person which brought out different parts in you. The context of that person's backstory, the context of what they represent to your mind, the context of what you represent to their mind, right? And them being other, merely labeled by the mind, or troublemaker, merely labeled by the mind. You just go through these processes, right? You just think agent, action, object, all of it, empty, because, dependent. And then your story opens up so wide that there's no room for a story, right? You started with this little story of I am bad, or I said a mean thing, but I'm justified, or they deserved it, or whatever. It was a small story. It was your story. And then it opened up to the story of everybody involved. And then you realize everybody involved was the people in the room, but all of humanity throughout beginningless time, <laughs> right? And the story becomes so big, it loses borders and dissolves. And you relax and move on. While in the back of your mind saying, try to be polite tomorrow, <laughs> right? But then it's not so loaded anymore. It's not so heavy. It's not a whole thing. Does that make sense? So purification using the wisdom realizing emptiness starts as this analytical process. When we've realized it directly, we purify eons and eons of negative karma every time we meditate on emptiness. So we do hugely efficient purification at that point. But it takes a lot of this kind of introductory thinking yourself through these steps to get there. So the work we're doing right here today is building the mental momentum to realize emptiness directly, right? Like this day is not wasted. This is an important day for all of us, even if we've heard this teaching a million times, because it brings the merit and the momentum, which will turn into a realization. It's repetition and depth that lead to something turning conceptual to perceptual, from fabricated to spontaneous. Yeah. So I see there's want to know about dependent arising. How can we practice? I hope that's now clear, but um, if you have follow up questions. Follow-up questions are welcome. Ready to do a little bit deeper? Yep, good, okay. 
So the levels of dependent arising, remember, this is relative conventional nature of things, not the ultimate nature of things, but they're the accurate relative nature of things for a valid consciousness. So this is how we access ultimate truth is by understanding relative truth accurately. Okay, so here are those three levels again, causal dependency, which is relying on causes and conditions, mutual dependency, relying on parts and whole and or context, merely labeled dependency, rely on a valid basis of designation and the mind's imputation. So we were just talking about what makes a valid basis and why do we label what we label. Okay, so here's the causal one. This is from Geshe Tashi Sering's Emptiness book, um, that Foundation of Buddhist Thought series, volume five. It's an excellent book. Um, he says, the first level of dependent arising is gross or coarse compared to the second and third levels. Gross in that it's relatively easy to understand how result depends on cause, right? Remember seed and sprout. Without a cause, the result cannot happen. And many of his sutras, including the many kinds of elements, the Buddha reiterates one of his most important ideas. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. So these lines are so profound and crucial because they clearly explain dependent arising. Things come into being, independence on other things and events. Conversely, things cease or stop independence on other things and events. So in Buddhist terms, dependent arising within cyclic existence is shown by the 12 links of dependent origination. Remember the wheel of life with the monster that we talked about earlier and is good to go back to. Briefly, the explanation of how we cycle in samsara is due to the ever repeating chains of causes and effects. We are reborn again and again because we crave rebirth. And we do that because we have form and feelings. And that comes about because we have consciousness and karma. And that comes from ignorance. And so ignorance creates craving, creates karma, creates delusions and suffering, creates rebirth and so on over and over and over again forever until we break the chain. From the point of view of causal dependency, dependent arising means that each result is completely dependent on causes. This can apply to all impermanent phenomena but every Buddhist master, from the Buddha to Nagarjuna to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, has emphasized that the main focus of our investigation should be on what is most important to us, how to overcome pain and difficulties and experience happiness and joy, right? So this is where it becomes real life, yeah? Real life is, I want more happiness. What are the causes for happiness? <laughs> I want less suffering. What are the causes of suffering? This whole causal dependency becomes immediately smacking us in our face because we think I want happiness. So I'm going to have a biscuit or I'm going to have a vacation or I'm going to have an affair or whatever it is you're going to do. And those aren't the causes of happiness, but we think they are because of ignorance. Right? So this is right in our face, everyday life stuff. So if you can think about causal dependency, that everything has a substantial cause that's of a similar type to the result. So if I want happiness, I need to create causes that are in alignment with that, meaning positive, beneficial, constructive states of mind and actions of speech and body that are similarly positive then I'll have happiness. And not only will I have happiness, I'll be nicer to people and they'll have more conditions for their happiness to arise. And the world will be better and world peace and yay, right? So, you know, don't, don't let go of the immediacy of these teachings, you know, just because there's a lot of words there. 
So Nagajuna, this guy here with the snakes over his head, which are actually Nagas, um, Nagajuna's famous text, Fundamental Wisdom, starts by praising the Buddha because he taught dependent arising. So in chapter 24, there's an examination of the Four Noble Truths. In chapter 26, an elaboration of the Four Noble Truths when he examines the 12 links of dependent origination. Geshe says that he feels that in order to overcome suffering and achieve happiness, we need to understand dependent arising on all the different levels, but particularly on this level of causal dependency. It shouldn't be underestimated and we shouldn't skip a deep understanding of this level, thinking that the subtler levels are more important. Okay, so causal dependency related to causes and results, related to karma, all that stuff. How does that one sit? Any questions about causal dependency before we do more deeply with mutual dependency? Pop right in. Good, tick. The wonderful thing about that is that when causes don't exist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when causes don't exist, then the results don't exist. Exactly, if it's not happening, didn't create the cause for it. Yeah, it can be empowering and make us more strategic. Yeah. So in fact, causal dependency is Nagarjuna's main argument to explain the noble truths of complete cessation of suffering and its origin. Yeah. He uses causal dependency to show how the 12 links of dependent origination operate within us in both forward and reverse order, moving from the first to the last, from ignorance to karma and so on. He shows how each comes into being produced from the previous and in reverse order from last to first. When he shows us how each can be extinguished by eliminating the former. We can thus come to understand that the complete cessation of suffering and its origin is really possible for us and for Nagarjuna and Prasangika masters, that kind of complete cessation within our mind stream is possible because the dependently arisen mind is empty of inherent nature. So that's the key sentence, right? Complete cessation of suffering and its causes is possible because the dependently arisen mind is empty of inherent nature. So, Remember samsara is you, yeah? Don't think samsara is I'm going out into samsara, right? We talk that way in Buddhist circles sometimes, like you're going to the grocery store, you're going out into samsara, right? Um, remember samsara is what? The five aggregates appropriated and contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions, right? The five aggregates are basically the body and the mind, right? Form the body, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, primary consciousness, mind, right? So that is samsara because it's contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions, right? So we don't want that to be contaminated. We want to have a Buddha mind. We want to develop our Buddha potential. We need to look at that relative eye and then see that it's empty of inherent existence. Yeah, the I in our own mental continuum. So um, Kevin was asking, does one have to break only one of the 12 links to be free of suffering? Um, yes and no, <laughs> yes and no. Um, the crucial link is the ignorance link, but we also have a grand opportunity to disrupt the system in between feeling and craving. Okay, so the picture of the 12 links, there's feeling depicted by the guy with the arrow in his eye. <laughs> that's, that's the depiction of feeling, which is to show us that feeling is such a large part of our experience, we couldn't ignore it, just like we couldn't ignore an arrow in our eyeball. <laughs> Right? So, you know, Buddhists are so graphic, right? You're like, oh, here's just a picture. We show it to children. He's a guy with an arrow in his eye, you know, like it's normal, but really think there's a reason for that imagery. Feeling is significant. You know, sometimes people think Buddhists don't acknowledge or honor feelings, but 
feelings are important. What you're trying to do is to break the association between feeling turning into craving and grasping. So that's our window of opportunity, like in daily life. So if you can have a feeling of pleasant arise and then not chase whatever it was that was the condition for that, you start to break the chain. Or if you have an unpleasant feeling arise physically or mentally, and you don't develop aversion and anger and pushing away energy in relation to that, you start to break the pattern. So this is the thing, remember that we were talking about yesterday that if you feel something, then you believe it and then you act from it, it all happens so quickly. It's as if it's one moment. But actually, you can feel something and then not believe that it's to do with everything in front of you. You can realize it's a conditioned response. It's a karmic response. And then choose to respond differently than you did the last time. Yeah. So that's the main window. Of course, ideally, you know, your ignorance you're working on all the time. And the easiest way to work on ignorance is to keep remembering dependent arising all three levels again and again. Yeah. Yeah. Follow up question about that. It was a good question, Kevin. Um, you know, to break any of the links, you're going to need solid wisdom, but those are your main ones. Yeah, Val. Oh, we got to unmute you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I have a question that's been bothering me for a long time, and I don't seem to get an answer no matter what teachings I listen to. Um, like, like we all say that we want to obtain enlightenment or Buddhahood to, so that we can better help all sentient beings. Yet, as we go from life to life, um, I mean, it said that the only thing that goes forward is my, you know, karma and any disturbing emotions. And from there, it develops into another consciousness. But, you know, it's not me. It's not my consciousness. I'm dead. Nada. Gone. You know? Um, so life, they say that you carry forward life after life after life after life until you obtain Buddhahood as long as you, you know, get the right causes and conditions to do that, to practice. So who, 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 who gets Who's enlightened? getting enlightened? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like who yeah. becomes a Buddha? Cause I'm gone. Yeah. I'm Elvis gone. has left the building, right? Yeah. <laughs> like there is no more Val who's getting enlightened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If everybody skips over that part. <laughs> well, remember that you know, the consciousness, the fundamental consciousness that goes from life to life, the yeah. fundamental consciousness that carries the karmic seeds. It's, you know, you can label self, but then you have a name on top of self. So right now you've got yeah. Val plus self on mental Desi continuum. Desi designated Val, you know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But when you die, you just get a new name, but it's not a different self. The self, of course, is changing moment to moment, but you know, it's a continuation of that same self. Right. So then you're going to be called Henry or whatever, or, you know, spot uh -huh. or whatever, you know, yeah. whatever's going to yeah. happen next. Right? Exactly. Yeah. But it's still the continuity of consciousness. But it's not me. It's oh, not and that's the, the whole point, right? Like, who are, the who are you? Who are you now? Yeah. Who are you? I'm it's going to be habits, right? It's going to be variations on a theme, right? So I'm guessing because you're a Dharma student, you're a nice person, you know, you're kind to small children and animals on a good day, right? Although you like, you've got some good habits, good right? <laughs> you're going to take with you, say you don't develop any realizations in this life, okay? You might, and you might have already, but say you don't develop any realizations. What you're taking okay. with you is karma and habit. So you're reborn in your next life. Say you're lucky enough to be a human again. You'll yeah. have the habit that thinks kindness is a good idea, right? That's some valness that you're taking with you. But it's not val anymore. It's a new name. But it's, you know, it's a continuation okay. of that same energy that you've started already this life. Just like think about when you were a kid. Uh -huh. Were there some odd ways of thinking about the world that were not the same as your family? You mm. know, right? Like we don't necessarily remember our past lives, do we? But we might have no. had some weird habits, 
right? That had nothing to do with our family of origin, right? Yeah. Right. And in a way that can help us say, oh, that's who I was. That was a strong enough habit that it carried from past life to now, even though I don't mm -hmm. remember the story or the context, it's a continuation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. also, you know, it might've been one of those children that, you know, wanted to stamp on ants and was like, ha ha, and burn them with magnifying glasses. That's unfortunate, but you probably grew out of it. And hopefully now in your next life, you won't do it. You know, so we carried the good, we carried the bad. We just didn't carry the memory because our mind is not yeah. clear enough to carry the memory. Mm -hmm. Does that help or do you feel stuck still? No, see that, that doesn't answer the question though. I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I Because you, is the problem that you believe that there's an inherent self? That might be the well, very core issue. Um, no, it's it's just the question that I I find I do believe that something goes from life to life to life mm -hmm. to life. But the consciousness that I know as me will be gone. Well, yeah, that's true in one sense. Is that a problem? No, I, I, I wonder what gets enlightened, like, what am I doing all this work for if I'm not going to get enlightened in the end? <laughs> the consciousness that you're labeling like me, Val onto, myself. right, the consciousness that you're My labeling Val onto will, is not going to be probably enlightened in this lifetime. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's not the one that's going to finally end up at the, the, the you know, at the, the end, end zone, you know? I guess it just feels like maybe um, this sense of identity, you know, of or ownership of the consciousness is maybe the thing to unpack. Because uh -huh. who were you in your past life? Whoever you were in I your past know. life, right? I don't know either, right? But whoever you were in your past yeah. life has an influence on who you are now, right? You have the inheritance or the legacy of the habits yeah. you started in that life. Just yeah. similarly, your next life is going to inherit what you got up to yes. this life. Right. So it's like, instead of ancestral inheritance, yeah, it's, it's yeah. consciousness inheritance. So yeah. your work is not going to be lost, is my point. See, your the work person isn't lost. that I got my, all of my goodies from, they're gone too. Exactly. But you're, you're still living the energy that they created. Yeah. You know, that energy is not lost that mental energy is not yeah. lost and your mental energy won't be lost. Uh -huh. And without you in the chain of lifetimes, enlightenment yeah. would be much delayed for that consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, your work isn't lost. Yeah. 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 Okay. Look, so, so, yeah. You know, keep, keep asking the question until you feel satisfied for sure. Okay. Don't let it go. I'll keep thinking on that. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Ask Yeshla and, you know, Kind of maybe yeah. also think what's the simplest form of the question? You know, that sometimes helps yeah. me when I'm trying to nut something out, like I'm stuck on yeah. this exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I thought we'd have just a short break and then our last meditation. Do you guys want like five minute leg stretch? Yeah. Okay. All right. So see you in five minutes.
Come on back. Okay. So I see there's some more questions in the chat and uh, in order to address them, we'd have to sacrifice the meditation. So I think we better do the meditation, but um, don't lose your questions, keep asking. I think, um, Dave, this is gonna be just the beginning of the conversation, right? You guys are doing DB on this subject? Yep. 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 So, so don't lose your questions, they're good ones. So just take a minute and settle into meditation posture. Nice straight back. Let go of any physical tension you might be carrying. And then revive your positive motivation, refuge in bodhicitta. Just re-articulate it to yourself so it resonates, like hitting refresh on a browser. Wake it up again. and shift back to the breath.
And we'll just watch the breath for about a minute, minute and a half. Allow any surface distractions to settle. And now we'll shift to analysis. And we'll just explore in a very gentle introductory way, the object of negation, meaning the inherently existent self. So in order to see that it doesn't exist, we have to find how it appears to our mind, what our incorrect belief is first. So take a minute where you remember a time that your I or yourself felt very solid. So you can think of a time when you were praised or criticized or in danger. But just kind of scan through your memories and try and find that sense of I appearing to your mind very solidly. This is me. I am being celebrated or I am being attacked. I am in danger, something like that. You can even say your own name to yourself a few times. Try to bring up to the surface that sense of self, that one that seems either the core or the boss. And don't challenge it right away. Allow it to appear to yourself. The impression you have of it. Clarify it and hold it.
And now very gently, not scaring that impression away, keeping it, ask yourself, where? Where are you, that self? That one that feels so solid, so real. Where are you exactly? You can scan within the body or scan within the mind. Let's see if you have a sense of location, like the central hub that everything operates from. Or a puppeteer pulling the strings. Whatever it is, just have a look. Does the self feel centralized at the heart center or in the brain? Or does it feel like something abstract that is simply aware? You're not looking for a correct answer. You're just looking for an experiential answer. What is the self like for me? Where and how does it seem to be? And whether you find it in a concrete way or you find it in an abstract way, ask it a few more questions. Ask it, are you unrelated to anything else? Are you independent of your parts? Self-perpetuating. Are you other than the parts that you label self onto? Is there something additional within the parts or holding them, carrying them? And for a moment, you might choose the idea of discernment or recognition as being the boss or the self. 
the one distinguishing this from that. And then you notice that ability to label and distinguish and recognize is based on there being something to recognize, is based on having moved there in the first place. And so then you might think, oh, then I'm intention. I am my intention to move towards or away from different mental experiences and physical experiences. That intention or will, some sort of volition, that must be, that must be the self. And then you think, well, I'm only moving towards this or away from that, chasing this idea, avoiding that one, mainly because of how I feel. Pleasant, I chase. Unpleasant, I avoid. So maybe the self is feeling But then again, what I'm feeling is related to what I come into contact with. The meeting of sense power and sense object, consciousness. There's got to be some sort of catalyst for feeling. So maybe it's that contact. Maybe that's the boss. Maybe that's the self. But now already you're starting to distrust that. You see that every part of your mental experience, these mental factors particularly, are dependent on one another, dependent on so many other stimuli. No one of them is in charge. They just sort of take turns being dominant or seeming to lead the way, but they're actually all infinitely interconnected as well as changing moment to moment. So there is mental experience, it is happening, but it's not inherently existent and no one part of it is the self. The self is just merely labeled there. And so if the self is not the mental factors, maybe it's the main mind, the primary consciousness, just clarity and awareness the reflective aspect that sees generalities, not so obsessed with specifics. The sky, not the clouds. Seems like it might be me that reflectiveness, almost like a container for thought. But 
but no, in order to reflect, there must be something to reflect off of. Reflector and reflection, two different things. dependent on one another. And so there is primary consciousness, but it's not inherently existent. There is primary consciousness, but it is not the self. It's just another part of the basis. So see if you can find the non-finding of inherently existent self, that there simply isn't one. And so whether that analysis sparked any new ideas and understandings or not, the process is building the momentum we need to have the realizations we need to cut the root of samsara. So think that all of that energy goes into this dedication. And then adding to that dedication, the long life prayers for our teachers. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life and may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. <laughs> And you can relax your attention. Okay, everybody, thanks very much. And Thank you. Um, indeed so much. <laughs> and have a good rest of your day. Great. And thanks very much for your Thank beautiful you questions. Much. I'm sorry I couldn't answer all your questions. Not enough time, but uh, keep asking them. And uh, see you when I see you. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Uh, please do come back. We'll be trying to make arrangements to have you come back and teach again. Oh, cheers. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yes, 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 please. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.